This sermon is titled The Gift of Righteousness Part 1. Be enriched as you listen. So, today and uh, next Sunday, we want to spend some time meditating on this this topic or this theme, the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Now, all of us we know that god is so big so powerful so mighty and uh, god is perfect he's absolutely perfect and yet you and i have the courage or we dare to go before god we dare to go in his presence to pray to worship and so on but what is our perception or what is our thought on What does God think about me as I approach him? Sometimes for many of us we think ah oh, God is angry with me you know God isn't happy with me you know we may have that kind of a perception that this is how or this is what God thinks about me as I approach him maybe it's God's not is is angry you know and so I need to go there before God uh unsure of how what he feels about me. Sometimes we even have a a a a sense of guilt and shame and condemnation each time we keep approaching God. Now because of this, now I'm not saying it's wrong to be sorry for the wrong we've done for the sin we've done. We'll address that. but what we must become aware and god desires wants us to become aware is that as believers he has given to us a gift it's the gift of righteousness he's given to that gift to us and he wants us to live out of that place as we relate to him and as we engage in various things in life and ministry we need to live out of this gift of righteousness and so that's the main thrust of this two part message it really to impress on our hearts to help us understand what god has done for us by giving us this gift of righteousness now if we live under and sadly many believers do they live under a continuous sense of guilt shame and condemnation they're living under this and so they journey throughout their christian life and the christian experience feeling all always feeling guilty condemned unworthy unfit unaccepted unloved or at least they're not sure if they are really loved and really accepted in the eyes of god and so they continue to live like that and so can you can imagine from the time we are born again all the way till you know we leave this earth we live under that sh- that sense of guilt and shame and condemnation and we are never we ne- never experience freedom and release in the presence of God or in what he's called us to do and that is not something God wants for us he wants us to understand the gift of righteousness is given to us and hopefully as we explore the word of God together we will be able to understand that and it will set many of us free we must first of all recognize that righteousness is a free gift of grace it is a gift that god has given to us and he's given it to every one of us children to all of us as believers we've been justified freely by his grace now just for us to understand the word righteousness and the word justified in the new testament they come from the same greek word sometimes it's translated righteous sometimes it's translated justified but it means the same thing to be righteous means to be justified it means to be made just as if i've never sinned it means you're acquitted you're completely clean in the eyes of god that's what it means to be righteous now let's look at some scriptures romans chapter 3 verses 22 to 24 Romans chapter 3 verses 22 to 24. Look at what the apostle Paul writes. He says, "Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He says this, look, there is no difference. We have all sinned. We all have the same starting point. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 23. So it doesn't matter, you know, you fall, fell short by one meter or you fell short by 10 meters. We've still fallen short of the glory of God. We've all started off that way. But here's good news. Verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is given to all and it is on all who believe. So think about this. The righteousness of God. We're not talking about some human righteousness, somebody else's righteousness. We're not talking about a righteousness that some religious system can give you. We're talking about God Almighty giving to you and putting upon you His own righteousness. It says the righteousness of God. It is to all and on all who believe. Are you a believer? So say this with me. The righteousness of God is on me, has been given to me. Let's say it again. The righteousness of God is on me, is given to me. It's like example. This is an example. If I had a very dirty, filthy robe, and here's God who's, who's got this robe so clean, so perfect. He takes his robe, he says, and he removes my dirty robe, and he puts his perfectly clean robe on me. That's what he's done. It's to me and on me. It's to you and on you. God's own righteousness. Are you listening? He didn't make a, you know, somebody else's. He didn't take Angel Gabriel's righteousness and give it to you. He took his own righteousness, the righteousness of God, God's own perfection, God's own completeness, God's own absolute cleanness has been given to you and it's upon you and it came to you simply through faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way any one of us could ever enter the presence of God. That's the only way any one of us could even have access to them. Anything less than that would be disqualified, not fit to enter the presence of God. And so what did God do? His righteousness is given to you. It's upon you. How did it come? Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's all. To all who believe. Notice the word all. Given to all and on all who believe. Are you with me? And then look at verse 24. He says, now he's talking about, he's using the word justified. Having been justified, being justified. The word justified is the same meaning as the word righteous. So we could say being righteous or being justified, being made just as if I never sinned. Being justified freely. By His grace. Freely. Nothing to do. Nothing. There's no way you can earn it. You've been justified. Can we say this together? I've been made just as if I never sinned. Let's say it together. I've been made just as if I never sinned. This is going to take a few minutes for it to sink in. I've been made... Just as if I never sinned. One more time so that you can at least believe it. <laughs> I've been made just as if I never sinned. That's what verse 24 says. Being justified freely by His grace. Freely. There's nothing you and I can do to earn it. We've been justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ. That means because of the redemptive work of Jesus, God has done this for you and me. Amen? It's okay to say amen in church. I get excited. I don't know if you're excited. 
Such a liberating truth to know that we are righteous, that we've been made righteous, and we've been declared just as if we've never sinned because of what Jesus Christ did for us. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul once again highlights this. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is saying, I've made you. You've become the righteousness of God in Christ. Think about that. The righteousness of God is to you, it's on you, and He's made you to be that. You've become the righteousness of God. How did it happen? Because Jesus, who knew no sin, took upon Himself my dirty robe. And He said, because I'm wearing your dirty robe, you can now wear my righteousness. And He says, I've made you my righteousness. You've become the righteousness of God. It's such an awesome thought. Sometimes it's hard for us even to accept this. But the truth is God has done it for you. He's made you to become His righteousness. Because that's the only way you and I could ever stand before His throne. And I want to emphasize that this righteousness is a gift. I want to emphasize that. That righteousness is God's amazing gift to us. Romans 5.17, we will be looking at this verse again next week, but I want to highlight just one part of it. Paul writes, if by one man's offense death reigned to the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life. Through Christ. Notice the gift of righteousness. It's a gift, and God's given it to you. It means you and I can never earn it. Don't even try to earn it. Because He's given it to you as a gift. The gift of righteousness. That means whether you pray one hour or whether you pray ten hours, you're the righteousness God's given you is just the same. You see, in our minds, in our religious thinking, we think, oh, today I'm more holy, I'm more righteous today because I prayed more today than yesterday. And actually, that's not true. Because the righteousness you have was given to you as a gift. And it was God's own righteousness. You can't make it any more righteous. It's as righteous as it can be. And it was given to you as a gift. Now, of course, we encourage people to pray as much as you can. I'm not saying don't pray less. But the point is that righteousness doesn't change because of your works. It's God's righteousness, and it's given to you as a gift. Amen? So, we must learn to live from this place of grace. That's a challenge for us. Living from this place of grace that we have. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified, meaning it's a work that's been done, having been justified by faith, What's, what's the outcome? What are the results of this? What, is, what are the outcomes of this? Having been justified by faith, what is the outcome? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Look at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that means you've been made righteous by faith. You are, you've been made just as if you never sinned by faith. What's the outcome? You have peace with God. You have peace with God. That means God is not mad at you. God is your friend. You're at peace. Like if two people on earth, you're at peace. 
you know, everything's fine. You're not angry with that person, that person's not angry with you. Everything's good. Now you have peace with God. Say this with me. I have peace with God. I love Him. He loves me. We're fine with each other. <laughs> the Bible says we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God. So God is not mad at you. God is not angry with you. He's at peace with you. Because you've been justified by faith. And then verse 2. And so he says, we have access into this grace in which we stand. So what is your standing before God? We began with that question. What is your standing before God? Your standing before God is in a place of grace, of divine favor. So when God looks at you, He looks at you with gracious eyes. He looks at you with favor in His eyes because you're standing in a place of grace. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ did. It's a gift that God has given to you. Amen? Do you believe it? You're in this place of grace before God. You're standing in this place of grace. Now, why is this so important? Why understanding this biblical truth of the, right, the gift of righteousness, why is it so important? Number one, because it affects how we approach God. If we don't understand this, then every time we come before God in prayer or in worship, we always say, oh God, I'm so, I'm so filthy. Oh God, I'm so dirty. I am such a bad person. You know, we, we go into this self-condemning mode as though by condemning yourself, God is going to love you more. It doesn't change. It's only an expression that you haven't understood this truth of the gift of righteousness. But when you understand it, then you can come before God, and we will see this later, with confidence, with boldness, with complete freedom, knowing that He has made you, He has given you, He's put upon you His righteousness. We don't deserve it, but it's a gift. Why is understanding this truth so important? Because when it, 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 it helps us deal with shame, guilt, and condemnation. We'll talk about that. This is such an important thing because so many believers, they have become believers, they love Jesus, but they're still deep inside. There's a sense of guilt and shame and condemnation. Still going on inside. Why is understanding this truth about the gift of righteousness, why is it so important? Because it helps us deal with one of Satan's biggest weapons, and that is accusations. The devil, one of his names is, he's the accuser of the brethren. What does he do? He accuses you and me. Tells us that we are unfit, unworthy, God hates us. He accuses us before our God. And the accu accusations of the enemy cripple us. You get up in the morning, hallelujah, this is the day the Lord has made. <laughs> the accusation of the enemy comes against you. Remember you kicked the dog yesterday? <laughs> Finish. Flat. Accusation. God doesn't love you. That was so uh, hateful of you to kick your dog. I'm just making something up. But, you know. God doesn't love you. You lost your temper. One accusation. Knocked out for the rest of the week. And the believer is crippled. The believer cannot pray. The believer cannot go out and serve God. Why? The accusations of the enemy. That's his weapon. He's the accuser of the brethren. So he accuses us day and night. Says we are unfit before God. So knowing this truth of righteousness, of the gift of righteousness, is so important to deal with the accusations of the enemy. And lastly, why is knowing this truth so important? Because it helps us deal with the challenges of life. When you face a challenge, and which we will all face, how do you, how do you see it? 
Do you see God is angry with me? That's why he's judging me. He's condemning me. He's, he, is that why it's happening? Or you're saying, hey, I know this challenge is, but God is with me. We're going to conquer it. What storm can rise between God and me? How do you look at the life situation? If you have this understanding of this truth of righteousness, that God has given it to you and God is for you, then no matter what challenge you face, you're going to say, God is with me. This challenge will be subdued. I will conquer it. But if you don't have the understanding, then you'll say, oh, maybe God has put this on me. God is teaching me. God is angry with me. God is upset with me. Uh, God was upset on the which side of the bed I got off today, and that's why he's doing this to me. All kinds of things. But when you understand this truth, that God has made you righteous, He's made you accepted in His eyes, then, then everything changes. Amen? Now let's talk a little bit, little psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but I know how to read. So. <laughs> now, psychologists will tell us, and they've done all the research, so we don't have to do it. A little bit of guilt, shame, and condemnation. They talk about the weight of guilt and shame and its effect on emotional health. A little bit of remorse or shame for the wrong is a good thing because then it helps us take corrective action. It's not that we become cold and indifferent. So when you do something wrong and there is a remorse, that's a good thing because it'll tell you, Tell you, force you to take corrective action. But if you're living under a weight of guilt, shame, and condemnation, and this is psychology, they tell, you, tell us that it often leads to emotional distress. The fear, the anxiety, the sense of worthlessness, low self-esteem, critical self-talk, all these things trace back to this root of this weight of guilt and shame. It's not healthy for your emotional well-being. And so many believers are carrying this sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation. It's not doing them good emotionally either. But God has an antidote. He provided it for us through the cross of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm giving you my gift of righteousness so you never, ever have to live under that, 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 that blanket, that cloud of guilt, shame, and condemnation. You don't have to carry this weight of the shame and the guilt and the condemnation of whatever you've done. It's dealt with, and I've given you my gift of righteousness. Amen? And so it is so liberating to receive this truth in God's Word. So let's talk about the practical side of it. So when you and I understand that and receive this gift of understanding and, and say, yes, God, thank you for this gift of righteousness. It is given to me freely by your grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. What happens to us? We have freedom in the presence of God. You know, suppose, and I don't know what kind of a boss you have, and I hope I am a good boss, some of our staff are sitting here. I don't know. <laughs> but if you have a bad boss, there is no sense of freedom in his presence. You don't know if you sneeze, he might fire you. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> so you kind of you come into his presence with fear and trembling. You don't know what mood he is in today. But not so with God. God is good all the time. And you and I can have complete freedom in His presence. You can come to Him. You can talk your heart to Him. You can share your heart with Him. You're welcome to do that as a child of God. There's complete freedom in His presence. And that freedom, that sense of freedom is so possible because you recognize that because He has given you this gift of righteousness, you are holy, blameless, and pleasing in His eyes. You're holy, you're blameless, you're accepted. And Paul brings this out in Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. 
He says that even before the foundation of the world, God decided, and I'm just paraphrasing this, God decided that you will be holy without blame in His eyes. And then He says in verse 6, He says, we have been accepted in the Beloved. The word accepted just means pleasing. We are pleasing in Christ. So put your right hand up and say this with me. I am holy, blameless, accepted, and pleasing in the eyes of my Father. Let's say it one more time. I am holy. I'm blameless. I'm accepted. I'm pleasing in the eyes of my Father. Amen? That's who you are. That's what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. We didn't earn it, but He did it for us. Amen? So every time you go before God, that's how you should. I'm holy. I'm accepted. I'm pleasing. I don't need to sneak through the back door. Quickly give Him a prayer request and run. No! I don't need to crawl into His presence. No! Come boldly. Because you, He made you holy, accepted, blameless, pleasing in His eyes. So you come like that into His presence. Another important thing, you begin to see yourself as qualified and fit. You see here again, many times we have this wrong idea that Maybe I'm not so qualified for the blessings of God. That person, the other person, he reads, I read one chapter, he reads ten chapters. I pray half an hour, he prays three hours. So he is more qualified to receive the blessing of God. See, we tend to think like that. I'm just saying this is how we all tend to think. But that's not true. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. What does it say? Paul writes, he says, give thanks to the Father. Who has qualified us? Who qualified you? Not your prayer, not your Bible reading, not your pastor, not your denomination. Who qualified you? God the Father. So he says, give thanks to the Father. Who has qualified us to partake of our inheritance? Meaning, God has qualified you. So that you can enjoy your share of the blessings that He gives to all His children. I'm just paraphrasing that. Put it simple English. God has qualified you. He's made you fit. He's made you worthy. He's made you deserving of every blessing that He makes available to His children. So you don't have to think, oh, that person is more qualified than me. No. Don't think like that. We're all being made fit. Now, the difference is some may choose to take part of the blessing and some may choose not to. The difference is there's an enemy that's trying to hinder us from enjoying the blessings and some don't fight back. Some just give in. That's the difference. But as from God's side, He's qualified all of us to partake of the blessings He has for His people. So there's nothing more you can do to become more qualified. No more higher degrees. <laughs> nothing more you can do. He's already qualified to, to partake, to enjoy the blessings He gives to His children. Jesus put it like this in Luke 12, 32. He said, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. God's happy. He's excited to give you what's there. So don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. Fear not. Relax. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So understand that you're, you are a saint, not a sinner. So tell yourself this. Put your hand on your own head. <laughs> Said, you are a saint, not a sinner. You know, in the, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, in almost all of his epistles, 
you notice this. He says, to the saints who are in such and such a place. Example, Philippians 1 verse 1. To the saints in Christ Jesus. Now, he could have also said to all the dear sinners, I am writing to you. He could have written like that. He could, started, he could have started all his epistles like that. My dear sinners, we are all in the same boat. But not one of his epistles he starts like that. Almost all his epistles to the saints. It's a big difference. I Meaning he's telling us this is what, how God looks at you. God looks at you as a saint. God sees you as somebody who's righteous. God sees you as somebody whom he's made fit for himself. So he calls you by your name. He calls you the way you are. Yes, we were all sinners. But God said, look, I've done such a good job on you. You're a saint. You're righteous in Jesus Christ. So it's time you and I started calling ourselves the way God calls us. You are accepted. You're welcome. And so we need a shift from a sin and servant mentality to a righteousness and son mentality. So don't think of yourself as a sinner. Don't think of yourself as a servant. Think of yourself as someone who's righteous and who's a son and a daughter of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, Paul writes, he says this, God did not, did not give us the spirit of slavery, a bondage. It's an old English word to uh, talk about being a servant. God didn't give us that spirit of being a servant, but he gave us the spirit of sonship, of adoption, so we can call him Abba Father. You say, but, uh, but Paul said, I'm a born servant. Yeah. But he served as a son. He didn't serve as a servant. So what do you mean? A servant works for wages. A son works because he belongs. It's a big difference. The servant will come and make the bed. Otherwise, no salary at the end of the month. The son makes the bed because, hey, this is my house. Now, some sons need to be told to make the beds, but that's a different story. But, you know, generally, a son and a daughter does work in the house because it's their house. They'll go the extra mile. It's their home. But a servant will try to escape. Go or leave early. You know. Unless the master says do extra, they won't do. Son or daughter, it's their home. It's a big difference. So you serve because you're a son, because you're a daughter. And the mentality you have is that of somebody who's righteous and you are doing this for your father. Not for some boss. It's a big difference. Amen? So, understand the gift of righteousness. God has made you and me welcome. And that's why the Bible says we can come boldly with confidence and freedom into His presence. Through faith in Jesus Christ. And yet I'm not diminishing the fact that we have to enter with awe and reverence. So we are holding both of these together. We enter with awe and reverence. Yes, we have complete freedom to come boldly. We have been made righteous. Which enables us to come into the very presence of God. But then when we, we do come with awe and reverence because He is God. There's a holy reverence. So we, we, I'm not saying that we act like hooligans before the throne room. <laughs> no, no, no. We understand this God is so great, so majestic. But we come as a son, as a daughter, as somebody who's been made righteous, who's welcome in his presence. There's that balance. And before I close, I want to just deal with one aspect. Because if we don't do this, the message might sound lopsided. So we ask the question, okay, 
I am the righteousness of God. God has given it to me. He's put it upon me. He's made me become righteousness. But what if we sin? What happens when I sin? Now, in some parts of the Christian church, they, some, when they teach the righteousness of God, they might say, well, a believer can never sin because you've been made righteous. Or they may say, your sin is not a real sin. I don't know from where they came up with the idea of a holy sin, but <laughs> your sin is not a real sin. Or they may say, well, God never sees it because you're in Christ and all the hid evil, it's hidden. How can you hide evil in what is good? How can you hide sin in Jesus? Or some may even come up with the notion that, well, because all your sins were already forgiven, now when you sin, there's nothing to be paid for. Well, the New Testament, to the church, Paul writes, Jesus speaks to the churches in Revelation. He tells them all to repent. So if, they did, if their sins were already forgiven before they committed, what is it that he's telling them to repent from? The point I'm making is that none of these notions that some people teach is true. It cannot be supported by the Bible. But sadly, a big part of Christian world embraced the, these wrong notions. And so we need to understand Scripture correctly. We are the righteousness of God. But when you sin, it's important to say you've sinned. It just doesn't go away by itself. If we sin, we don't deny that we have sinned. Look, if you got angry, you got angry. If you told a lie, you told a lie. If you did something wrong, it's wrong. So don't just say, I am the righteousness of God, and this doesn't matter. It matters. What must we do? Well, the Bible tells us to confess, to repent of our sin. Both Old and New Testament, Proverbs 28 uh, says, Proverbs 28, verse 13, whoever who, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So you confess and you forsake, you repent. And 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, it's so clear. John writes, he says, you know, if we say that we have fellowship with God, but then you walk in darkness, then you're not doing the right thing. So let's, let's get this clear. You can't say, I'm fellowshipping with God and live like the devil. Hallelujah. You can't do that. No. If we walk in the light, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. So my sin affects my ability to fellowship with God. It doesn't change what Jesus did on the cross. It doesn't diminish any of that. It doesn't change what God has given to me by grace. But it does affect my ability to fellowship with God. Because to fellowship with Him, I have to walk in the light. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Then, He says, verse 9, if we confess our sins... Is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you sin, you do something wrong, what do you do? Confess it. God, I am sorry. I know what I did was wrong. Please forgive me. Don't pretend like it's not there. It is there. You need to confess. You need to repent. Because then he says in verse 9, if we say, uh, verse, next verse, verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, yeah, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So God will correct us. There is correction and conviction that comes into our hearts by his spirit, by his word, and even our own conscience. So there are three things telling us, hey, you messed up. Your own conscience, the word of God, and the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, don't grieve him. That means when you, when you and I do something wrong, we grieve him. 
He's going to tell you, hey, I've been grieved. I don't like it. Those are pigeons, not doves. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, so God corrects us. He convicts us. And so there is godly sorrow that produces repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 says, Godly sorrow which leads us to repentance. It's a good thing. That means when you do something wrong, that moment you can feel that you've grieved the Holy Spirit. Your conscience is telling you you should not have done that. And you realize the Word of God is teaching us not to do that. And so you, there's godly sorrow. And it's a good thing. Paul says, godly sorrow leads us to repentance. So you go before God. Say, God, I repent. I'm sorry. I'm ready to turn. So that part is a good part. And it's a neglected part in the church because sometimes... There's such a bit, you know, people just want you to feel good. They overemphasize uh, the truth about righteousness, but don't tell you that you do need to repent when you sin. But here's the point. We must, we must not continue to live under guilt, shame, and condemnation. Don't continue in that. That's not healthy. You confess, you repent, there's godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. We receive the cleansing power of the blood. Then you acknowledge that you are holy, blameless, accepted, and pleasing in His eyes. You don't let that condemnation continue. Why? John writes in 1 John 3, 20 and 21. He says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us, if your own heart is condemning you, and the conscience is the voice of your heart. So it's condemning you. You know, God knows everything. God knows He's forgiven you, but your heart is still condemning you. And if your heart condemns you, then you have no confidence before God. That's the problem with many believers. Their heart is still condemning them. They haven't embraced the gift of righteousness. And so inside, they're still living under a sense of shame, guilt, and condemnation. So there's no confidence toward God. So what's the antidote? And I promise to close with this. Worship to him, please come. The Bible tells us to clear our own conscience. To clear your own conscience. So the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 10, 19 to 22, he says, we have boldness to enter the presence of God. We have boldness to enter through the blood of Jesus. Through a new and living babe which he has made through his own flesh. And so he says, let us draw near with full assurance of faith and with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That word sprinkling in the book of Hebrews is to talk about applying the blood of Jesus. So you have boldness to enter into God's presence through the blood. But there's a problem. You still have an evil conscience. Your own conscience is condemning you, making you feel sh ashamed and guilty and condemned. So he says, sprinkle your heart. Wash your own heart from an evil conscience. The same blood that gives you access, that same blood cleanses your conscience. So you've got to tell your heart, heart, fine, you've been washed. You're a clean heart. Chill, chill, cheer up. <laughs> you're washed heart every sin is gone you need to tell your heart cleanse your heart sprinkle your heart from an evil conscience from a conscience of shame guilt and condemnation clean it sprinkle it with the blood I understand it and say I am righteous I am holy without blame accepted in the beloved I can come freely into His presence. Yes, I come with awe and reverence, but I come knowing I am welcome in the presence of the Father. I come knowing I can place my petitions before Him. I come knowing He's made me His son and daughter. I come knowing He has uh, authorized me to be a part of His kingdom and to execute the plans and purposes of His kingdom. I come with that sense of confidence. Amen? And this changes the dynamic of how we engage with God and our own conscience. Next Sunday, we'll continue this. We'll talk about how we deal with the accusations of the enemy.
Because remember, that's one of the biggest weapons Satan uses. And how we face life challenges. That when you ha understand God has given you his gift of righteousness, the challenge you're facing in life is not God trying to put you down. It's not God being against you. It's life throwing its storms or it's the enemy trying to do something against you. But you can face it knowing that God will always cause you to triumph. There's victory on the other side because God is journeying through it with you. He's for you. He's not against you. Storms will come. It comes to everybody. But when you know that God is on your side, you know you'll come through. Amen? We'll talk about that next Sunday. Let's rise to our feet, please. Just think about what you heard this morning. You are the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is to you, it's on you, and you have become the righteousness of God. For a lack of better words, for a lack of better way to say this, you are as righteous as God himself. Because His righteousness is on you. You didn't earn it. We didn't earn it. He gave it to us. That means when we go before God, what's on Him is on us. You're welcome in His presence. And this was given to you as a gift. It was given to you because of what Jesus did on the cross. You've been justified. We know we are earthly, mortal beings, sinful, but all of that has changed in that God has given to us His gift of righteousness. We don't have to live under a sense of unworthiness, under a sense of guilt or shame or condemnation. May that be taken off of your life. Amen? For each one of us, May we be completely released from every sense of guilt, shame, condemnation. It doesn't matter what the past is. It's under the blood of Jesus. It's been washed by the blood. And you have been made the righteousness of God. And God is saying, you're accepted. God is saying, there is no condemnation against you. God is saying, you're welcome in His presence. Amen. Don't let the enemy accuse you. Put you down. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth, for your word. And God, even this morning, let it be released in the hearts and minds of your people because of your truth. Let the weight of guilt and shame and condemnation, accusation of the enemy and that may have weighed people down, this moment, God, let it be lifted. Let people be set free in the name of Jesus. Let that cloud that hung over their lives be removed permanently and let them know there is freedom in your presence. Let them know that they are accepted in your presence. Let them know that they are your beloved children, sons and daughters. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the redemption that's in Christ. We thank you that you've made each one of us qualified and fit, worthy and deserving of every blessing that you have for your people. And so, Lord, in the lives of your people, let there be open doors. Let doors be unlocked for them. Let, it, let them step into new things that you ordained for their lives. 
That when you see a door, when you, and I'm speaking to us now, when you see a door before you that seems shut, and you know God wants you to go that way, press through. Don't accept the closed door as God's verdict, but look at that closed door and say, be opened in the name of Jesus. When God wants you to advance, what is it that the enemy can do to stop your advancing? Press forward because God is on your side. And He's about to unlock those doors that seem shut before you. May you see open doors in your life. Doors opening up for you. Because God is for you. He's not against you. Father God, we just thank you that as we go from this place this morning, you are for us. You are with us. And your people will see victories. Your people will see doors open up in their lives. Your people will see the impossible becoming possible in their lives. Because you are for us, Father. And we thank you. We bless you, O oh God. We bless you, O oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to just take one more minute to dwell on this. If there are people here this morning, right now, you, you are facing a door that's locked before you. I want you to just raise your hand up because we're going to pray for you. You are facing a door that's been locked for you right now. Just raise your hand. Just put your hand up. I want other people just around them to go to them. Start praying for them. Just turn around. Pray with them. Pray for them. If there are people, I'm going to pray from here, but I, we, we need to minister to one another as God's people. Just go to these people. They are facing a door that's locked in front of them. They are facing a door that's locked in front of them. But today as we pray, those doors are going to open up for their lives. Go around. Just stand next to them. Pray with them. Come on, people. Move around. You are qualified. You have been made fit to pray. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray for them. I, I, every person, just stand with them. Man to man, lady to lady, just, or whoever, it doesn't matter. Just stand next to them pray. And say, God, today, in the lives of these people, that locked door will be opened. We decree, decree that door to swing open, that lock to be unlocked, that door to be opened up. Because God says to you, I have set before you an open door, and no man shall shut it. No man shall shut it. I have set before you an open door, and no man shall shut it. Those doors will be open. That lock will be open. That lock will be unlocked. And God, today, send your angels, send your ministering angels with the keys of heaven, with the keys that will open up that specific door, with the key that will open up that lock in their lives. God, send your ministering spirits, send your angels, God, to open up those doors, to open up for it for them. And let your children march boldly. Let your children walk through that door. And then let them say, My Father in heaven, open this door for me. My Father in heaven, declare an open door for me. And no man and no devil can shut it. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, let this door be open for your life. Let this door be open in your life. As God himself opens this up for you. You walk through boldly and you say, My Father in heaven has opened this door and no man and no devil can stop it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So God, let this happen. Let this happen in the lives of your people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. And may you receive your miracle. May you testify to the glory of God that God has done it as His people prayed with you today, as His, His people came around you, joined their faith with you. God is faithful. God has done it. Thank you, Father. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you that you've done this, Father God. We praise you, Father. And Lord, wherever people are watching, across whichever nation they're watching from, we thank you for ministering to them. Wherever they are, in their situation, where you open doors up for their lives. Thank you for doing this, Father. In the name of Jesus, thank you, God. Oh, Father, we worship you. We praise you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. Thank you. I want to take a moment just to give an invitation. You know, this message is so powerful because no religion can do this for you. No man and no woman can give you the gift of righteousness. No, no man, no woman, and no religion can make you right in the eyes of God. Think about it. But the Bible is saying that God gives it to you and me as a free gift through Jesus Christ. A free gift. Who can offer this? But it comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to just give an invitation before we dismiss. If there's anybody here in this auditorium, maybe a friend invited you here, maybe you're watching online, and you've never believed in Jesus Christ to be your God, to be your Savior, then I, we want to give you an invitation to do that today. Nobody's forcing you, nobody's compelling you, but you heard the message, and it's your decision to make. Do you want this gift of righteousness? God's giving it to you as a free gift, but you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you've never done that, if you've never ever done it in your life, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. And those of you watching online, if you've never done this in your life, do this today. And say, Lord, I, I need this. I want this. Let's pray together. If you feel prompted in your heart to pray with me, and you've never done this before, pray this with me, please. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I heard that you died for my sins. You were buried. You rose up again. And you're alive today. Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Give me this gift of righteousness. Come into my life. And I choose to follow you. And you alone. The rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If there's anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. We want to celebrate with you. We want to thank God for what He's done in your life. So if you don't mind, could you please raise your hand? You, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time today. Anyone here in this auditorium, please raise your hand. One right up here. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Let, just wave it at me. Anyone else? Anyone else? You prayed this prayer for the very first time. There's another hand there. God bless you. God bless you. Another person there. Anyone else? You prayed this prayer with me. For the very first time, very first time. Anybody else? Anyone else? I see another hand waving at the back. I don't know. I it's right there, right there. God bless you. God bless you. It's right there. Right there at the back. God bless you. Anybody else? Just wave your hand. Wave your hand. God bless you. God bless you. This is the best thing that can happen to you. For your sins to be washed away. And for Jesus to give you his gift of righteousness. And to say... You're clean in my eyes. This is only what God can do. We are so happy. Our ushers have given you a little bag that has some free resources. Please use it. There's a card that says decision card. If you can please write your name and number. Give it back to the usher so that someone from the church office will call you and show you or t tell you how to use these resources. Please do that. We're going to close. If you need prayer, uh, I just call all our pastors, life group leaders. Please make yourselves available in front. So we'd be available to pray and minister to people. Amen? Are you happy that you came to the house of God today? Amen? Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.